So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Morrow from um, CNRS, Corse, and IS. And he's going to tell us about revisiting motivic cohomology. So I didn't have time to watch it last night, but it was the Oscars. And in recognition of that, I'd like to start with a slightly longer list of thanks than usual. So thanks for the introduction to the organizers of the workshop for inviting me to speak here and to give the opening act to warm you up to particularly to Bhagavad Bhatt and Jacob Lurie for organizing the special year. Uh, but around them, there's the entire administrative body at the IAS and the uh, the financing for members in mathematics, the Wolfenson Fund, which actually makes our participation here possible and makes the special year so special. So I'd like to express my gratitude to these individuals and to the, the IAS as a whole. The rest of the speech is not about Oppenheimer, but about a different IAS figure, namely Vaivotsky. So in preparing this talk on motivic cohomology, I've decided to focus on a, on a particular piece of the of the story, namely that of A1 invariant motivic cohomology, particularly as envisioned by Vaivotsky, because the, the theory is now in a, in a very satisfactory state. And I'd like to explain to you what that means. It's going to be a mostly expository account without too many proofs. Um, and I'll start with, a, with an introduction so that we're all on the, on the right footing. So Balenson and Lichtenbaum in the 80s had a, a vision that for, let's say, for suitable schemes X, there should exist some theory of motivic cohomology. So let me say there should exist what we'll call the motivic complexes. which I'll denote by weight J motivic complex of X. So some complex of abelian groups for J greater than or equal to zero uh, with certain properties. But firstly, just so that we can be clear about notation, um, either by design or by some theorem or by definition, there's no motivic cohomology in negative weight. And once we've got the complexes, we have the motivic cohomology groups defined by taking the cohomologies of the complexes. So that's it for notation. And then what do, properties do we want these to have? It's not the backpack, is it? No. So firstly, we want them to not be too far away from things that we know and love. Uh, so we expect some relations to a tau, and more generally when we're at the residue characteristic to syntomic cohomology. Maybe I remark in passing for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the younger members of the audience that syntomic cohomology is not something new. Uh, Lichtenbaum had access to the right theory of syntomic cohomology for smooth varieties and characteristic P, and he had precise conjectures on how it ought to be related to motivic cohomology. And to, let me say, also to algebraic cycles. And so in particular, I want to highlight the fact and let me call this valence and Lichtenbaum isomorphism. If one looks at motivic cohomology with finite coefficients, so I take my complex mod L and then I take the cohomology groups, I ask that these be the same as the tau cohomology of X with coefficients in mu L for the same twist. So here's where L is going to be some prime which is invertible on X. And we have to add the crucial condition that we only want this to be true in the range when the cohomological degree is less than the weight. Now beyond this range, when we exceed the weight, 
we, we don't expect to be able to detect a tau cohomology using, using motivic cohomology. So let me take that as some of the, the, the exemplification of this relation to a talent's atomic cohomology. And then secondly, we ask for relation to algebraic K theory, by a spectral sequence, uh, which is typically called the motivic, or by analogy with topology, the atiyah hertzberg spectral sequence, Uh, starting on E2 page, looking like various, assembling together all the motivic cohomologies with some indexing that you don't need to worry about. And converging to the algebraic K groups. And then I should really add some three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about all the conditions that we might like such a, such a theory to satisfy. Let me, let me focus on a few of them too, to simplify the story today. Um, so that is to say some, some, a very simplistic take on it is that whatever this theory is, ah, I wanted to add one story, one more comment that the, the spectral sequence should degenerate rationally. Sorry, I'm running out of space there. So it degenerates after tensoring the whole thing by Q, or even more precisely after some bounded denominators. So a simplistic take on the on the on the on the idea is that motivic cohomology should be very tightly controlled rationally by algebraic K theory with finite coefficients by a tile symptomic cohomology, at least in some range. One would like some integral relations to algebraic cycles. And from that point of view, the conjecture is saying that some of all the, all the gluing problems that you would need to resolve to, to build such a theory based on these constraints can indeed be resolved. Now, I wrote suitable schemes X because when one looks back at the classical literature, it's not exactly clear what they had in mind, but we do now understand this is reasonable to hope for, and there's been a lot of progress on its existence for arbitrary arbitrary schemes, one can even aim for derived schemes or beyond that. Um, but what I would instead like to talk about today, because it's, uh, it's what has in fact received until recently most attention, is the following less hard, I'm careful not to say easier, even if it's logically the same, uh, less hard variant of the conjecture in which we instead look, we simplify everything by forcing them to be A1 invariant. Let me say, maybe look for is not the right word. Yeah, okay, look for is all right. We assume that they're out there somewhere. We've got to find them. Um, we're going to instead look for A1 invariant motivic complexes. And let me write these as weight J, A1 motivic cohomology. With the following properties. So again, we expect these to be related to a tau and symptomic cohomology. And in fact, we even hope for this, this exact balance and Lichtenbaum style isomorphism. The crucial difference comes in two. We'd again like a spectral sequence converging to algebraic K theory, but it's not going to be algebraic K theory on the nose. We're going to replace K theory by its A, its minimal A1 invariant modification. So it's A, let me call it its A1 invariantification. This is traditionally called homotopy invariant K theory. So you, you force K theory to be homotopy invariant by, by redefining its value as the co-limit of the K theories of 
all dimensional affine spaces. over X, so you, you perform the Suslin construction. And so in that way you force K theory to be, to be A1 invariant in the, in the minimal fashion. And then one can ask a very similar question, can one build some, some theory of motivic cohomology simultaneously related to, to a talent syntomic cohomology, but now to this, that s this simplification of K theory. Now, a particularly important case is when X is regular. And in that case, the two versions of the conjecture coincide. Because the regularity uh, implies that K theory is A1 invariant. And so the K theory is the same as the A1 invariant K theory. So then you're really trying to solve the same problem. And the traditional case, which received the most attention and, 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 and is completely understood, is that of smooth schemes. Am I going to need to leave this on the board? Nevertheless, it'll show up. Nevertheless, it will show up. In fact, we'll see exactly that by, if you throw in the right truncation of symptomic cohomology, then it's what will show up in the A1 invariant theory. We'll see. Uh, so, I mean, A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. Yeah. No, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was not sure what the clearest thing to write was. I mean, I think the A1, the A2, the A3. I assemble them into some simplicial gadget by in construction, and I just take cater with all the terms and geometrically realize. Uh, so what I want to state here covers covers body of work. It starts in 86 when, when Bloch first wrote down a candidate for motivic cohomology, and I think runs to about 2008. Well, Bloch. Friedlander, Geiser, Levine, Ross, Spitzweck, Suslin, and last but certainly not least, Vygotsky. And so they tell us that in the smooth case, so that means that X is smooth either over a field, or, and this will be crucial for us, or over a mixed characteristic Dedekind domain, then such a theory does indeed exist. And I'd like to tell you some of the, some additional properties of them. Which perhaps could have been included in the original way in which I stated the conjecture, but I've chosen to do it like this to simplify the, the forthcoming exposition. So the, right, so my X is now smooth over a field or a Dedekind domain. The theorem tells me that I have some theory of motivic complexes. The weight zero theory is just Zariski cohomology with constant coefficients in Z. Weight one 
is Shifton's risky cohomology of GM. And now we come to the description with finite coefficients uh, for L invertible on X. If I look at motivic cohomology of weight J mod L, I get the following. So let me, let me write it like follows. I hope it's clear. I start with a tau cohomology coefficients in mu L J state twist. We truncate it. Valence and Lichtenbaum tell us that we should only see the piece which is in degrees less than or equal to the, the weight. So I truncate it in that range. And then I just Zariski Schieferfy it. And now if I compute what this is doing in degrees up to J, I can eliminate those two terms and I just see that I'm looking like a tau cohomology in degrees up to J. And so this desired Bayless and Lichtenbaum isomorphism does indeed, does indeed hold, but that's then the, the more precise formula that one wants. And finally, I, I just want to mention that there's this, this formula for the complex in terms of algebraic cycles. Namely, weight J motivic cohomology of our smooth scheme X is equivalent to blocks cycle complex. Uh, okay, I need to shift it to J cohomologically to the to the to the right for for indexing purposes, but this isn't so important. So block cycle complex I've decided not to write down. It's a explicitly given complex, which in degree okay, degree n depending on how, how you index it, is going to be given by certain algebraic cycles on n-dimensional affine space over X. And you impose the, so excuse me, it's going to be given by the free abelian group generated by these. And you impose the condition that these cycles should intersect certain hyperplanes properly. So that when you intersect with these, you get algebraic cycles in n minus one dimensional affine space. And that lets you define a boundary map. So you write down this complex of, of algebraic cycles on all these affine spaces. It gives you an explicit complex and a, a theorem encoded in the work, particularly of so Vyvotsky and Levine, is that this turns out to be equivalent to, to motivic cohomology as you, as you might otherwise define it. So it gives a very explicit model in terms of, in terms of algebraic cycles, which is useful for calculations. And so that's the, the, the traditional state of affairs. So if I numbered it, so one. And so what I'd like to discuss today is some work with, with Tom Bachman and Eldon Almanto. Um, which the punchline is, is essentially that if we work with this less hard version of the problem and we try to find some A1 invariant theory of motivic cohomology, uh, then we can do so uh, for, for any scheme. Let me, let me say QC, QS, okay, but then we could just glue. And it, it won't be till the very end of the statement of the theorem, perhaps, that we, we, we see that it's something beyond just the construction. But let me begin by telling you some properties that this theory has, uh, which are akin to, to those of the smooth case. Uh, 
have enough space there for something. Uh, so the A1 motivic cohomology of weight zero of our arbitrary QCQS scheme, no longer the Zariski cohomology, but it's the CDH cohomology of X with coefficients in Z. So let me say a word about the CDH here. So this is so this is Vyvodsky's CDH topology. Uh, let's say on QCQS schemes, which is the Goten Dick topology defined as follows. It's generated by the Nisnevich topology. And by covers given given by blowups. So whenever I've got some, say, closed z into y, and some y prime onto y, I declare it to be a cover where these fit into a blowup square y. Excuse me, z prime to y prime y. Z like so is a blow up square. So essentially, I allow myself to blow up some scheme Y in some center in Z. So Y prime to Y is then a proper map, which is an isomorphism outside Z. And I allow myself then to declare that this blow up and the exceptional, in the exceptional, in the exceptional locus. Uh, I will cover in this go topology. So this was introduced by Vyvodsky specifically as a means to study singular schemes, because in principle, if you believe resolution of singularities, then any scheme in this topology should be locally regular. You should be able to blow it up until it's regular, and that precisely means it can be covered in this topology by something regular. But we can work with it even without resolution of singularities. Yeah, yeah, I insist that things be, I insist that it be finite type, yeah. Right, so in fact, the more precise, the more, what I more precisely require is that both the closed embedding and the, and the proper map be a finite presentation, and that that be an isomorphism outside Z. Yeah, you're right, I don't want to blow, I don't want to actually blow up some infinitely generated idea. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? Yes, it includes nil invariance with finitely generated ideals. Otherwise, there's some finite area here. Yeah. Right, so as, as Peter says, in particular, anything which is CD, the CDH sheaf is in particular going to be nil invariant for finitely generated ideals. Because then I, I blow up, I blow up emptily. <laughs> And I blow up a nil ideal doesn't do anything. Um, so why does, let me continue this. Why does the CDH topology appear? I mean, we, 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 we trying to build some A1 invariant theory. I would say that the best explanation of this is a Term of Suzinski. So remember that in this A1 invariant version of the conjecture, we're trying to refine something, we're trying to refine A1 invariant K theory. And there's a term of Suzinski that says that KH is surprisingly a CDH sheaf. So CDH sheaves naturally appear in the story. And this formula. that A1 invariant weight zero motivic cohomology should be somehow the simplest CDH sheaf you can write down. Is conjecture number 12 of Vyvodsky. So we'll be explaining more about this later, but essentially around 2000, Vyvodsky laid out his vision of how one should construct A1 invariant motivic cohomology and how it should look. And he has very precise conjectures. That's conjecture number 12. 
and we'll see more of them later. Uh, let me now continue with the general properties. So the weight one A1 motivic cohomology is again given similarly to the smooth case, but with the modification that we can now expect of replacing Zariski by CDH. Next, I'm going to write down the analog of this description in terms of a tau cohomology. But I, I, I'm afraid that I'd be evicted from the workshop if there wasn't something piatic somewhere. So let me now take any prime p. Then we have an on the nose description. of the mod p a1 invariant motivic cohomology of my arbitrary QCQS scheme as follows. Uh, let me leave a little bit of space to perform the necessary operations. Um, so I start with symptomic cohomology. So here I put my weight J symptomic cohomology. Okay, so in, in, in if things were P complete, this would be as introduced in, in the second paper with Batten and Schultzer. Uh, but since I've got some general non-P complete scheme here, this is what you'll find in Bat Lurie's absolute prismatic cohomology. And now I do the following operations to it. So, so Bainis and Lichtenbaum tell me I should only see such invariance in degrees less than the weight. So I truncate it in that range. And now I do some of the, the, the minimal operations that I need to make it a reasonable candidate. I, I believe I should get CDH sheaves because A1 invariant K theory is a CDH sheaf. So I force it to be a CDH sheaf. And I also know that I should get A1 invariant theories. So then I, I force it to be A1 invariant. So this again. I perform the same operation as I did in, oh, I forgot to, as I did in the case of K theory, I, I take some co-limit over the K theories of A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on to force in a universal way that cohomology theory to be A1 invariant. So three operations is quite a few, um, but let me say that the this process of forcing it to be A1 invariant is redundant. That is to say, already after the CDH chiefification, I do get something A1 invariant, so I can forget about doing the LA1. In a number of cases, so if X is a scheme over any field, and hence consequently, in fact, any Artinian ring because of, because of nil invariance everywhere, any perfectoid valuation ring, uh, that depends crucially on work of my student, Tess Brees, Or if we're working with mod P coefficients and I'm away from the characteristic, then I'm good for Z1 over P. And so if I'm working away from the characteristic, I'm telling you, then we can erase this, this A1 localization. In this case, symptomic cohomology collapses to a tau cohomology. The tau cohomology satisfies CDH descent. So I can also erase this in degrees 
less than or equal to j. And so you again, you can then read off that the desired relation uh, between motivic cohomology and the tau cohomology away from the characteristic holds. But it, again, it, it comes from a, a rather more precise formula. Yeah, yeah, so I wanted to say that conjecturally always. Right, so it, it, we, 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 we believe that that invariant is already a one invariant. That's equivalent to, it's, it's, it's a problem purely in syntomic or in fact purely in prismatic cohomology, which has, has also been conjectured by, by, by Bat and Matthew um, in the, the F smoothness paper. It's the F smoothness evaluation rings. Uh, and what Tess did was to prove this in the case of valuation rings which live over a perfectoid valuation ring. But the general case remains open. But somehow, for a lot of what I want to say, it doesn't actually matter that you have the extra LA1. But in principle, it, in principle, it shouldn't be there. That's right, that's right. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, no. No, no. It's absolutely no, no. No, it's, it's a theorem. It's a theorem. Yeah, yeah. It's a theorem that we, 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 we get information, in fact, coming from K theory. We get information coming from K theory. So we, we look. See, nevertheless, if you stop at that, that process, you can fit it into some spectral sequence, which is going to, going to, going to converge to mod LK theory away from the characteristic for which you have homotopy invariant. And so then you try to get information back from the abutment of the spectral sequence on the E2 page or via a type of argument that you know. Um, no, no, that's, that's, it's absolutely a theorem. It's by no means obvious. In fact, each of these cases is really a theorem. There's, there's no case in which it's clear that you can remove the LA1. In fact, even as a curiosity, if you look at statement two, I've got no, no LA1 on the right-hand side. So, so part of the theorem is telling you that if you just take CDH cohomology with coefficients in GM, then that's A1 invariant, which I, I don't know how to prove directly without passage through K-theory and all this machinery. It should be easier. It should be less hard. It should be less hard. But if, even if you get to evaluation ring, right, you've got to check that there's, that there's somehow no CDH Picard group of affine lines over valuation rings. Which by all means, I, I suspect one can do directly. But for us, it, it drops out of K-theory statement. Um, so fourth, I wanted to mention the actual sort of explicit formula. for what these complexes look like. Um, so I, I, I'm, we're gonna take the theory in the smooth case. And formally, okay, let, let me write it down and then explain the steps one by one. Uh, so I take the left card extension of motivic cohomology of theorem one from smooth schemes over Z to all QC, QF schemes. Okay, so I do the following. The first theorem in the traditional context tells me that in particular, if I'm a smooth scheme over Z, then I have a good theory of motivic cohomology. So I take that and I formally extend it to all schemes via a left Kahn extension process. So I define some new invariant on an arbitrary scheme by looking at traditional motivic cohomology on all smooth schemes to which my scheme is mapping. I take the co-limit over all of those. 
So it's big, but in principle, it's still somehow controlled by algebraic cycles. Then I force that to be both a CDH sheaf, and then I force it to be A1 invariant. And that produces this theory of A1 invariant motivic cohomology that I'm telling you exists. And in fact, you should take this as, as the definition. It looks ad hoc, it looks ad hoc. You, somehow, you, you, you just do the, the, the minimal thing you can do to modify the theory in the smooth case so that it's defined for all schemes and it's a CDH sheaf and it's A1 invariant. And I'm gonna see if I just have space here to squeeze that in 0.5. which is in some sense the justification that it's, it's not ad hoc, which is that this, these collection of cohomologies, if I look at all weight, A1 invariant motivic cohomology, which is say, defined by this, this is represented in the stable motivic homotopy category by the zero slice of the unit. And what I'm gonna be spending the rest of the talk doing is explaining what this means and explain, <laughs> explaining what this means and explaining why it justifies, why it, why it, it, it verifies that Vrevotsky's conjectural approach to, to A1 invariant motivic cohomology works. Um, but let me first, just say that so this is a construction you could have written down long ago. As I say, you take the minimal modification of traditional motivic cohomology from smooth schemes to all schemes so that it has some properties that you want. It's quite formal. Uh, and in that sense, I, I, I've hidden many of the actual subtleties. So one of these is that in order to be represented by anything in SH, you need your collection of cohomologies to satisfy the projective bundle formula. And proving that is, is, is in fact the core, the core of the work. Because if you take some theory on smooth things that satisfies projective bundle formula, and you just formally extend it in this way to, to arbitrary schemes, there's no reason at all that it should satisfy projective bundle formula. And as often mentioned, this type of statement that if you're away from the characteristic and you're still A1 invariant beyond where you've truncated mm -hmm. is, also, is, also, is also far from clear. Um, but what allows us to control this ad hoc looking construction is that when you go mod P, thanks to results in traditional motivic cohomology and to more recent results of Bat Matthew, this is the type of formula that drops out. And this can now be understood by progress in piadic cohomology, particularly syntomic and prismatic. So that's one place that we, that we, that we have some leverage to get a handle on this type of construction that wasn't previously possible. And the other is progress in the theory of localizing invariance. You see, when you go rationally everywhere, this theory will be tightly controlled by A1 invariant K theory or by K theory. And this we, 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 this we better understand thanks to progress in the theory of localizing invariance. But it's really this The final point that I would like to focus on for the rest of the talk um, to tell you how this is related to Vygotsky's work. Let me say SH
and Vyvodsky's approach to A1 invariant motivic cohomology. So I'm going to try to give a, 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 a minimal exposition of everything that you need to, to understand part five of the statement and what it's got to do with Vyvodsky's ideas. So I take some QCQS scheme, probably traditionally it was an Ethereum, but it's now understood that, that QCQS is, is fine. And I associate to this Morel Vyvodsky's uh, stable motivic homotopy category. Uh, the S stands for stable, but we're never going to see an unstable version. So let me tell you what you need to know about this. So it's a stable, presentably symmetrically, presentably symmetric monoidal infinity category. So it's like a triangulated category where I can tensor my tensor my objects together. And it comes equipped with a functor, infinite suspension functor, that associates to any smooth X scheme uh, something in SH. I, I, I'm not going to use infinite suspension notation. Let me write it as M, and let me orally cool m of y the motive of y it's just terminology but i find it useful to have in mind and this process of of cooking up classes in sh from from smooth schemes has the has the following properties so first the m of x is the unit. So that's in fact what we what we saw a moment ago in part five. Uh, it's, it's symmetric monoidal, so I've got some unit. More generally, it's compatible with products in the sense that it carries fiber products to tensor products. Uh, what else do I need? Right, so I contract the affine line. I ask that the motive of P1 be invertible. That is to say, tensoring by it is, a, is an auto equivalence of SH. And, and this implies, just to, to introduce a piece of notation, that the, sorry? Well, it's going to imply that the reduced motive is. Sorry? I want to be dualizable. Okay, so I want the reduced. You're right, that's in any case all I need. So take motive. which has reduced P1, so let me call this M bar P1. So this is what you get from P1 by discarding the, 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 the uninteresting part. Uh, namely the motive of the base. So this is invertible. And I think that's about all I need, except to add that SH 
together with this, this motive functor is then universal with respect to these properties. So initial. So, ah, sorry, yeah, 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 sorry, I missed one. Sorry. So let me add here that M, uh, let me just say M is Nisnevich local. So in fact, if I take opposites everywhere, and then it becomes a Nisnevich sheet, right? I wanted to carry Nisnevich distinguished squares to homotopy Cartesian squares in, inside SH. And once you add all those properties, then, 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 then the construction is, is, is universal. Uh, so it's the, if you want to build it, you start by taking your smooth schemes over X, and then you pretend you were building spaces, but instead of building spaces from points, you build spaces from smooth X schemes. Uh, and then at some point you contract the affine line, you stabilize, and at that point I would say you're, you're still somehow of a geometric flavor, and then as you begin to invert the Tate motive more and more and more, you, you go further and further away from that. So M is covariant. Should be that M off is in this never sheet. Uh, so I also wanted to mention, um, but you can also characterize SH as being, being the initial six functor formalism, satisfying some properties. So, so one way or another, it's, it's one way or another, it, it has some, 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 some natural characterizations. But how do you actually think about objects inside here? Um, so if you've got such an object and you have some integer j, you can cook up some associated weight j cohomology theory. So this will be some A1 invariant this Nevitch sheaf of spectra defined, actually you can define it on all QCQS X schemes. Let me give it a name, weight J cohomology associated to E. I say this will be some sheaf of spectra defined as follows. So I've got some X scheme F Say the structure map is F. Now, by by all the universality by the universality of SH, if I have an F mapping X to Y, I get a pullback map on SH. And I want to perform some X construction, so I look at the mapping spectrum inside SH of Y. Two the pullback of E coming from what? I look at Tate motive over Y to some power. So let me put in a power minus J. And then as J gets bigger and bigger, I would say that the information becomes more and more interesting. I think for, for convention purposes, I'm then going to shift this cohomologically uh, 2J up. And moreover, Vyvotsky and Marco Vaballo tell us that then I can characterize the image of this process. So if I if I take some, in fact, if I take some E and I look at the cohomologies EJ for all J, and I remember the fact, so you can see, if you look at this construction, you can see there's going to be some relation between what happens at J and J minus one. And exactly what that is, is that the weight J cohomology of projective space 
will be calculated to be the weight J cohomology of the base plus a shift and a twist of the weight, the weight J minus one cohomology of the base. So the P1 bundle formula for hold will hold for this family of cohomologies. And then in fact, the functor associating such an E to the family of cohomologies together with these P1 bundle equivalences is an equivalence of categories. And so that's useful for just, we can then write down elements of SH in terms of families of cohomologies. So for example, there's a unique object which represents You're right, for the characterization, I just said I should be on smooth. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so for example, there exists some, some gadget in SH of X representing this A1 invariant motivic cohomology from the second theorem. So it has the property that if I look at the associated weight J cohomology, of any y, I get the weight j a1 motivic cohomology of y in the sense of theorem two. And exactly as Peter said, I can only ensure that this is true on smooth x schemes. So it's a single gadget which is encoding all the a1 invariant motivic cohomologies on all smooth X schemes. The second example that I need is this K theory object denoted KGL. Inside SH such that and this then has the property so it's periodic, there's, there's, there's no such thing as twists of K-theory, so these disappear. And so if I perform this construction for any weight J, then the associated cohomology is just the A1 invariant K-theory of Y. So I need to tell you now one more structural, one more piece of structural information about SH. This is called the slice filtration. So let me try to try to justify it as follows. Suppose we didn't yet know that there was a reasonable theory of, of motivic cohomology, but we, we know it should be represented by some object inside SH. Where do we go, where do we go hunting for it? So we look at all these cohomology theories in SH and we impose some conditions on them. So firstly, Baylins and Lichtenbaum tell us that there's no such thing as, as, as negative weight motivic cohomology. So let's ask that EJ vanishes on smooth X schemes for all negative J. And, and, and then I was, I was trying to explain to you a moment ago the, how SH is built. And you, you, so you have this first step where you, you build things which are like schemes over spaces and you stabilize, and then you invert the Tate motive. So let's, let's not yet invert the Tate motive because that's when things become really, I would say non-geometric. So let me ask that E, this is traditionally called the effective part of SH. Let me ask that E be a co-limit of motives of smooth X schemes. So these, 
informally are going to be our candidates, but we could go looking for motivic cohomology if we didn't have it. And Vygotsky then tells us that there exists a functor denoted S upper zero and called the zero slice with the property that any object has a natural filtration I really like the terminology zero slice. I'm going to slice out a bit of your cohomology. So here's what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with our E here. We slice a bit out. And then and what you do when you're chopping up your cucumber on the chopping board, you move it across a bit, you slice again. You move it across a bit, you slice again. You move it across, you slice. And then you move the whole thing back. And you've got your cucumber, but it's been sliced up. And so E is our cucumber. And to move it across, and move it by some amount of the Tate motive. And then I slice, and then I have to move back. And Vygotsky tells us that our E carries some filtration with graded pieces that are given by that process. And in particular, since we've got a filtration, then we get a spectral sequence. And let me not write down what all the terms on the spectral sequence are. Then I do have to write down the numbers of the conjectures. Right, so in this way, we, we, can, we can decompose our cohomologies into these simpler pieces. We'll get some spectral sequence converging to cohomologies represented by, by E. I'm not sure I understand. The... It lands inside it. It lands inside it. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a composition of a left and a right adjoint. I think, given the time, this can be addressed afterwards. So as I briefly mentioned earlier, around 2000, Vygotsky laid out his program for where A1 invariant motivic cohomology should come from. And he more precisely made the following conjectures, which, which covers his 1, 7, and 10 in the list. That in SH, one should have an equivalence between two objects. So it's two candidates for motivic cohomology, if you like. Let me write them down. So firstly, we have KGLX. So KGLX is the object which represents A1 invariant K-theory. And the goal is to construct a spectral sequence coming from some cohomologies to A1 invariant K-theory. And his slice machinery tells you that if you take the zero slice of, of, of KGLX, then you will precisely get such a spectral sequence. So there's a good candidate. But at the same time, it's somehow cheating because you've just defined it purely in terms of K-theory, whereas it should have some intrinsic existence. And so what's the, the, the most, like what's the simplest, what's the simplest object you can write down? And if you believe that motivic cohomology should be some simple universal thing, you want to just write down the simplest, most universal object. So you start with the unit 
which is the motive of X itself, and you chop out the smallest piece you can. And you conjecture that they would be the same. And that this object represents a one invariant motivic cohomology. In fact, Vygotsky had still a third object in mind, which he called his motivic island dog McLean spectrum, which was supposed to be the real object representing motivic cohomology, but it was never really defined. Um, and for him, the most important conjecture was identifying this, this motivic cohomology spectrum with that object, which he considered the most natural thing sitting inside SH. Sorry? All. I mean, once you've got that, you get some equivalence in all weights. Because these are objects sitting inside SH. And so then I can perform this construction for any weight J. Right, these are objects that, that capture all, that capture families of cohomologies. And so the, and so the theorem with Bachman and Armanto uh, is that the above conjectures are true. for any QCQS scheme X. So in fact, more precisely, the zero slice of KGLX agrees with the zero slice of the unit, agrees with this object that we cooked up, possibly in some ad hoc fashion in theorem two. So it says that the program that Vygotsky imagined for constructing A1 invariant motivic cohomology works and gives the expected answer. I know I'm two minutes over, but I'm going to finish with one further statement because it's a known corollary, I think particularly by some, some work of, of Szyzynski and Degliese, once you resolve these conjectures, So let me write assignment so as to not make clear exactly where this is defined. And in any case, X will be some arbitrary QCQS scheme. And then I can, I can look at a candidate um, for the derived category of motives over X. So what is that? I look at modules over motivic cohomology. I take modules, for example, over the zero slice of the unit. That we know by the theorem represents motivic cohomology inside SH of X. And the, the, the corollary states that this admits a six functor formalism. Um, this, as I said, was, is, a, is, a, is a known consequence of the fact that. The theorem tells you that the zero slice of the unit behaves well under pullback. So if I have some random map f from x to y, I pull back the zero slice of the motive of x, I do get the zero slice of the motive of y. That's in fact the, the essential content of the, of the theorem. Uh, so let me finish there. Thank you very much. Not in the A1 invariant situation. Okay, so, so Almanto and I, okay, so a, another consequence of this, which I, I didn't have time to get to, sorry, of this, is that, okay, so we have, we have this trace map from, from algebraic K theory to topological cyclic homology. You can CDH sheafify it everywhere, and this will produce for you a trace map from KH theory to some sheafification of, of topological cyclic homology or negative cyclic homology. The target there carries some, some, some filtration, 
with graded pieces either given by symptomic cohomology or derived around cohomology. And a, a consequence of the theorem is that, is that that trace map respects the filtration on both sides. So it carries the, the filtration that you have on KH, the slice filtration that you have on KH, to the filtration that you have on in some TC or some, some HC minus term. And then it, it's known how to recover K theory from this, from this construction. And so you can use that to carry out some gluing process to build, in fact, a uh, good theory of motivic cohomology, not necessarily A1 invariant, for arbitrary schemes over fields. So that's what, that's what Eldon Armanto and I have, have done uh, in another talk I could have covered. Uh, and my, my student, Tess Brees, has, has done in mixed characteristic in, in, in many cases. So we now have a pretty good, pretty good understanding now of the, of the not necessarily A1 invariant context, context too. No. Except that they're modules over motivic cohomology. Maybe that buys you something. But otherwise, I don't think so. So, what if you just do projective bundle formula and keep it cohomology? Can you do away with all of the K factors? Well, I say conjecturally, the A1 localization shouldn't be there at all. Well, that's then a question for, for, for other people in the audience. I mean, uh, <laughs> Anala Hoiwa Iwasa are building this theory of not necessarily A1 invariant stable homotopy theory. Yes, I think, I think that's... I think that's not to be true. If you work on some, you can do some big version of SH in which you just directly CDH rather than Nistevich GFFI. And never A1 localized. No, I don't feel good about that. No, I, 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 no I'm, I'm uh, withdrawing any comments. No, I guess you, you, could, you could look at what Anale, Ross, and Hoiwa are doing and try to CDH Schieferfi. I mean, some of them should be here, so maybe they can answer instead. You try to CDH Schieferfi instead of Nisnevich Schieferfi, but you don't A1 localize and you still impose protection. I don't know. I don't know. There'll be, I mean, there'll be nothing in negative weights. There's nothing in negative weights. I'm not sure what you mean by one, one side of what? Yes, yes. In this case, it's, it's, it, in this case, it's, a, it's, an, it's an N indexed filtration. Okay, not, not on big KGL. I'd have to replace it by, by its connective cover. Uh, perhaps a better answer to your question is that as far as concerns the spectral sequence converging to, to A1 invariant K theory, this will be bounded under, under some mild hypotheses on X. You'll be sitting in the, in the bottom half plane and it will have some vanishing line. <laughs> 